I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. I'm Paul Singer, and as chairman of the Manhattan Institute, it's my honor to welcome everyone to the 12th annual Alexander Hamilton Dinner Award, award dinner. <laughs> On behalf of all the trustees, senior fellows, and everyone associated with the Manhattan Institute, I thank all of you for your generosity. I'm pleased to announce that tonight's dinner has raised $1.7 million for the Institute. I especially want to thank our patron-level supporters, the Vice Chairman of the Manhattan Institute, Dr. Michael Fedak and his wife, Marilyn, our fellow MI trustees, Cliff Asnes and Dan Loeb, and Brian Miller. I also want to thank our, benef um, our benefactor-level supporters, Myron Kaplan, and my fellow MI board members, Ravenel Curry, Tim Dalton, Jay Newman, and Tom Smith. <laughs> to all who have donated, your generosity has made this night and the institution possible. Moreover, in looking over this vast and distinguished audience, I see articulate champions of democratic capitalism of free enterprise, and even of private equity. In other words, in other words, I see 700 Cory Bookers. There's one difference between the Manhattan Institute and the Obama administration, um, among others. Um, and that difference is that at MI, Expressing favorable words about Bain Capital does not result in hostage videos or forced confessions. It's also worth pointing out that in supporting the Manhattan Institute, you're supporting a public policy organization of intellectual integrity, competence, and influence. There's nothing else quite like it. For over 30 years, MI has helped shape American political culture. It has supported research on the most challenging public policy issues of our times. Taxes, the financial crisis, economic growth, health care, energy, the legal system and tort reform, policing and crime, welfare and race, homeland security, urban life, education, culture, and many others. It has provided a home to outstanding writers and scholars and it has helped recast political debates, policy debates, and rethink some of the great issues of our time. And the Manhattan Institute's quarterly magazine, The City Journal, is one of the nation's premier magazines devoted to urban affairs and civic life. City Journal is admired for its elegance and excellence, its writers and contributors, and for the solutions it offers and the debates it provokes. I don't have to tell anyone in this room that during the last three and a half years, liberalism has been tried by the executive branch of the federal government and has failed. America is trying to make its way through the resulting mess. But this has created a rare opportunity. We're witnessing a conservative resurgency and ascendancy in America when the nation at every level is willing to embrace conservative ideas and governance in a way not seen since 1980. There is an election this year, as many of you know. The way I, a political fundraiser in my spare time, know that there's an election is that during an election year, friends and acquaintances who see me on the street cross hurriedly to the other side <laughs> or duck down into manholes. 
I believe this upcoming election will be more about ideas, policies, and the structure of the American economy and modalities of governance than any in recent history. This makes the work of MI particularly significant. If we are at a hinge point in history, as I believe we are, future historians will say that the Manhattan Institute played a part in helping to create it, to shape it, and to sustain it. To say it a different way, we are seeing a match between an institution and the needs of a nation. An institution uh, reveals itself not simply in the work it produces, but also in the individuals it honors. Which brings me to tonight's distinguished Hamilton Award honorees. Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana is the kind of public servant the American founders might have envisioned. He was a top congressional aide, the CEO of an important think tank, a successful businessman, and the director of the Office of Management and Budget before being elected to Indiana's governorship in 2004. Governor Daniels knows as much as anyone about how government actually works. The record he has built in Indiana, from education to spending restraint to infrastructure to accountability, easily qualifies him as among the best governors in America. It's been, say, it's been said that states are the laboratory of democracy. Indiana is an unusually successful laboratory and a model for the rest of America. James Q. Wilson. He was a towering intellectual figure, having written on subjects that included crime and human nature, drugs and addiction, moral character, families and communities, race, business ethics and capitalism, democracy and the Islamic world. He was among America's greatest political scientists and one of our finest moral philosophers. He edited the finest textbook on American government. The columnist George Will once referred to Jim Wilson as America's homegrown Chocqueville. The scholarship of Jim Wilson helped change this city. His work on public order and safety was heavily relied upon by Mayor Rudy Giuliani. James Q. Wilson was a good friend of all those who work and support the Manhattan Institute. It's our privilege to remember him tonight. And his eminence, Timothy Michael Cardinal Dolan, who in just a moment will be introduced by Mayor Koch. The Archbishop is a man with a deep intelligence and a thorough knowledge of history. And as President Obama has learned, Cardinal Dolan is also one who fiercely defends religious liberty. I applaud Cardinal Dolan. I and we applaud Cardinal Dolan for his leadership of a movement to save New York's indispensable Catholic schools, which are doing so much to train the hearts and minds of the young. With this, I thank all of you once again for your participation in tonight's event. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Ed Koch. I am now in my 88th year. <laughs> Since my entry into politics and government service, I have had the privilege of meeting, working with, and becoming friends with four Cardinals of New York. Terence Cardinal Cook, John Cardinal O'Connor, Edward Cardinal Egan, and the current Cardinal, whom I have the honor of introducing to you this evening, Timothy Cardinal Dole. Before I make that introduction, allow me to take a few moments to comment on my friendships 
with his predecessors. I was a congressman and then mayor when I first came to know Terence Cardinal Cook. Of the four cardinals I have known, he was the most beloved by the public, a very gentle man, and perceived early on as a saintly figure. Indeed, Cardinal Cook is currently being considered by the Vatican for sainthood, and I have given testimony in the Vatican's extensive inquiry into such designation. Having nothing to do with his saintliness, but much to do with our friendship, I recall when Cardinal Cook opened a Fifth Avenue door at St. Patrick's Cathedral that had been closed for a hundred years. He asked me to stand with him when he unlocked the entrance. As the sunlight poured through the open door, he said, Mayor Ed, this cathedral belongs to you. I could never ever get him to call me Ed. And when he said Mayor Ed, I could hear the neighing of horses, there being a very popular television show at the time featuring a talking horse called Mr. Ed. But at that moment, I did indeed feel as though the cathedral belonged to the Cardinal and to me. John Cardinal O'Connor came to St. Patrick's in 1984 after the death of Cardinal Cook. He was an archbishop at the time, and he invited me to go to Rome with him when he was called to receive his red hat. I have suggested to my Jewish brothers that we adopt the same color for our yarmulkes. <laughs> I did go to Rome with him and was one of the four witnesses who signed the deed bestowing upon him a Catholic church in the city of Rome. The signing of the deed is one of the rituals in the process of becoming a cardinal. On another occasion, Cardinal O'Connor invited me to join him in a pilgrimage for peace to Our Lady of Knock, a cathedral in Ireland, and I was delighted to go with him. When we were in Dublin, I was asked by Tony Guida, a New York City television reporter, what I thought of the role of the British troops in Ireland. And I said, I think they're peacemakers. I was then running for election as mayor in New York City. <laughs> when we disembarked at Kennedy, I followed Cardinal O'Connor off the plane, and I heard a reporter ask him what he thought of my characterization of the British. He replied, dumbest statement I've heard in years. <laughs> Pardon me. The papers are sticking together. Okay. When I entered City Hall on my return, my dear friend Paul Crotty, now a federal judge, but who was then my commissioner for housing, preservation, and development, said to me, Mayor, how could you compare three years of being nice with 800 years of oppression? They were both right to chastise me, and thankfully the New York City Irish community ultimately forgave me. I learned the meaning of the phrase invincibly ignorant as a result of my relationship with Cardinal O'Connor. I asked Catholic friends of mine 
why he tolerated and never berated me for the positions I held on a number of very controversial social issues which were at variance with his. I was told he held the view that I, being invincibly ignorant, was not responsible for my views. <laughs> Catholics, on the other hand, were fully responsible for their positions, and the Catholic Church, he would say, is not a salad bar from which Catholics may choose to accept or reject moral values and other obligations. I loved Cardinal O'Connor as a brother. Since his death, I have kept his funeral memorial card on my desk. And when I'm depressed, which I am occasionally, I hold the card and I become reinvigorated. Indeed, I believe holding his photo when I was in the hospital for six weeks in June of 2009 cured my spinal stenosis. I've been free of pain ever since, and I told the story to President Obama's former chief of staff, Bill Daley, brother of former Mayor Richard M. Daley of Chicago, and he asked me if he could borrow the photo. <laughs> Edward Cardinal Egan visited me in the hospital when I was in danger of dying from complications of the quadruple bypass surgery. I said to him, Your Eminence, I am not afraid of dying. I've had a very good life, and if God now needs a good Jewish lawyer, I'm happy to go. <laughs> he replied, Don't worry. He's not calling you. Your rates are too high. <laughs> of the three cardinals I have mentioned, Edward Cardinal Egan was the most intellectual and witty. With a patrician glance that could disembowel a cowardly legislator member of the clergy, and anyone else who is not straight with him. And now, on to Timothy Cardinal Dolan. He came to our city in 2009 as Archbishop of New York, and on February 18, 2012, he was elevated to Cardinal by His Holiness Pope Benedict. The position of Cardinal Archbishop of New York has long been recognized as the foremost position in the Roman Catholic hierarchy here in the United States. Cardinal Dolan is also president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, an honor bestowed upon him by his fellow bishops in the country. Holding that position, gives his voice a special significance and authority in the United States and worldwide. Those who have met the Cardinal love his affability and lack of formality. Don't be misled by his graciousness, however. He is tough as nails, and in a way, combines all the separate strengths of the cardinals I have ascribed to those who preceded him. Like Cardinal Cook, he has a gentleness that makes for an immediate bonding. Like Cardinal O'Connor, he believes it is his duty to teach the faith and make clear to all Roman Catholics that the church is not a salad bar. Like Cardinal Egan, he is an intellectual 
who will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone and with everyone in making his case on behalf of the Church and His Holiness the Pope. I'm delighted that he and I, in a short time, have established a warm relationship. I was truly pleased when he attended my 87th birthday party at Gracie Mansion, where former commissioners and deputy mayors from my administration gather every year to celebrate the event. And when I saw him enter the building, I immediately rushed to welcome him, and I said, Your Eminence, how can I help? His reply, show me where the bar is. <laughs> I was overwhelmed with joy when on St. Patrick's Day, before the Mass commenced, he asked me to join him, his fellow bishops, and a half a dozen Catholic laymen, very wealthy ones, I should add, <laughs> to announce that the renovation of St. Patrick's Cathedral at a cost of $175 million would begin. I love St. Patrick's Cathedral. At the request of the cardinals with whom I became good friends, I have attended Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve for more than 40 years. On one occasion, Cardinal O'Connor announced to the congregants, Mayor Koch is in his seat, let the Mass begin. <laughs> the city of New York has been very lucky with respect to the archbishops and cardinals who have reigned here. But one of them, to whom our new archbishop has looked for particular guidance, is Archbishop John Hughes, the first archbishop of New York. Archbishop Hughes was commonly referred to as Dagger John, because the cross that preceded his signature looked more like a dagger than a cross. Dagger John also earns his name for his courage and resiliency in fighting on behalf of his flock. Most notably in founding the remarkable system of Catholic schools here in New York City. At his installation mass in April 2009, wearing the very cross once worn by Bishop Hughes, Archbishop Dolan pledged himself to the flourishing of New York's Catholic schools. He has shown extraordinary leadership in the effort to prepare these schools to continue their critical mission well into the 21st century, an effort that many of you here tonight so generously support. In this challenging time, the cause of Catholic education could not ask for a greater champion. Let me close by saying that it is a great honor for this Jewish boy born in the Bronx to introduce a prince of the Roman Catholic Church and call him friend. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present to you His Eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop of New York. Is that okay? You were tremendous. You're better than the Pope. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you, are great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, here's a yeah, picture yeah. that. Uh oh, I got that. Oh, okay. And I'll get off. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to get off. I'm saying good things about you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Wow.
This, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You recognize, I presume, that, um, that anthem of gratitude from the Hebrew scriptures of the Bible, which the church often repeats during this beautiful Easter season. And it's sure in my heart this evening as I gratefully accept the Alexander Hamilton Award from the Manhattan Institute. Mr. Singer, Mr. Moan, illustrious guests, thank you very much. Three, three features enhance for me the radiance of this very happy event. And the first is that a gentleman, the stature of Mayor Ad Koch, would so graciously introduce me. Your Honor, thank you for your kind words. Seems to me, Mayor Koch, that you yourself brilliantly exemplify the noble goals of the Manhattan Institute, as you are an icon of the resolve, the common sense, the get things done grittiness that has made this city that loves you so much has made this city outstanding. Those very characteristics at the heart of the mission of the Manhattan Institute. That you too, Mayor Koch, have received this Alexander Hamilton Award makes me smile all the more. And that you would compare me <laughs> and that you would compare me to my heroes, Terrence Cardinal Cook, John Cardinal O'Connor, and Edward Cardinal Egan means the world. I'm glad to hear, Mayor Koch, that Cardinal Cook told you that this cathedral, St. Patrick's, belongs to you because I happen to have with me this evening a pledge card for our capital campaign <laughs> to redo the cathedral. And Mayor Koch was especially helpful to me this evening in sharing with me personal anecdotes, his recollections about Alexander Hamilton, the, uh, the man after whom the award is named. So thank you very much, Mayor Koch. What an honor to be with you this evening. And, and a second reason for my heartfelt gratitude this evening is the prestige and renown of this Manhattan Institute. Now, the firm that I belong to, the Catholic Church, was founded 2,000 years ago, right? The Manhattan Institute, only 34 years ago. But we are allies in a very noble cause. The development of fresh and noble ideas to address some of the most pressing public policy challenging challenges facing our nation and its cities. The belief that new ideas and a resolve based on hope render every human problem surmountable and that the redeemed side of human nature can creatively and effectively confront the woes that come from human nature's more coarse side. To be honored by this acclaimed institute, to be included in a, a dazzling lineup of former honorees such as Senator Moynihan, William F. Buckley, Peter Flanagan, Governor Kerry, Mayor Giuliani, Mayor Koch, Commissioner Kelly, Dr. Kissinger, the list goes on. And this evening's other honorees, Governor Daniels and James Q. Wilson, may he rest in peace. Well, my Lord, I haven't felt this good since I had breakfast with Stan Musial back home in St. Louis a couple of weeks back. And finally, everybody, number three, I relish this moment because it allows me to thank you, the Manhattan Institute, for your defense of and promotion of our beloved Catholic schools. As I, as I scan this impressive room with immense admiration this evening, I recognize men and women passionate about combating the major ills in our community. You know them better than I do, crime, drugs, unemployment, violence, fractured families, a, a crushing of the human spirit, homelessness, hunger, a culture 
seemingly addicted to selfishness and entitlement. I realize I'm biased, folks, but to me it seems so clear and so simple. There's one gritty, can-do, neighborhood-based, feisty institution that people like your Saul Stern and other scholars published in your own city journal have shown to be singularly effective in ameliorating every one of those challenges, namely Catholic schools. <clears throat> You know the data better than I do. Studies show that a four- or five-year-old child who enters kindergarten at one of our schools, and we're talking about inner-city kids from places like the South Bronx or the Lower East Side or Central Harlem, those kids, when they're able to persevere through elementary and into Catholic secondary schools, have a 95 percent chance of graduating, and 98 percent of those graduates go on to complete college. These graduates are then capable of what? Landing good jobs, more responsibly marrying and raising children in a stable family, avoiding drugs and crime, becoming more involved in this community we cherish, and reporting happier, healthier lives. Yeah, we've got to struggle for every dime. We can't afford the bureaucracy and red tape. We depend on parents and grandparents and neighborhoods. We got to argue for even the essentials do our kids and their folks injustice before a government that can't seem to believe that we do it twice as good as half the price. A, <clears throat> I wish they'd all learn from Indiana. And we're not ashamed about the place of God and faith and virtue, discipline and morals in the lives of our children whom we believe happen to have souls. Now, a lot of those things people consider to be toxic to education, but then they're not here tonight, are they? <laughs> the, the Manhattan Institute is. So you know what? I'm preaching to the choir. And in the spirit of Alexander Hamilton, I'm willing to duel with anybody who would question the genius of our schools. Thank you very much. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.